Welcome to Interviews to Suit with your host, W. Dennis Suit. Today's guest, former Speaker of the Georgia House of Representatives, Glenn Richardson. Today we are honored to have Glenn Richardson, former Speaker of the Georgia, House, Georgia General Assembly, and who is currently running for the 30th Senate District, including Paulding County. I think you are the first uh, uh, representative that we represent Paulding itself because you're from this area. I, I, I live in Paulding now, yeah. mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. um, the, to get into our conversations, I would like to say that, uh, Mr. Speaker, a man that tells me that he has never made a mistake is a man that I would not trust and I would not hire. Uh, and believe me, I own a business, and that's true. Uh, I want people working for me that have made mistakes because uh, and I want my elected officials to have made mistakes uh, because they have to learn their, their mistakes. You learn from mistakes. Nobody's made a mistake, never learned a thing in their life. <laughs> the, they've gained experience, knowledge. I'm sure you've gained experience, knowledge, humility, and you're a better individual for it. Uh, um, you have say, you've recently faced some hard issues yourself, um, made a few mistakes, went through a divorce, which is hurtful for both sides. Could you tell us what you've learned from these lessons? Well, Dennis, you know, all of us are, are, are the, we're the sum total of all of our life experiences, good and bad. Yes. And all men come into this world uh, with good and bad, and we carry it throughout. And uh, perhaps one of the important measures outside our spiritual context is that what we learn from those mistakes. Uh, there's an old adage that those who continue, uh, who f refuse to remember the past are forced to repeat it. Um, what have I, I I've learned is I hope I don't have to repeat the past, and I'm going to remember the past, and I'm not going to repeat it. But, but uh, uh, you know, you know I, often I often think, think if you could you go, go back, back in, in life, life and change, change things, things, what would you go back and change? And you realize if you change any one thing, you might change your whole trajectory of life and what you know. Uh, it's not to say you condone what you've done. I sought forgiveness from my God, my family. And from the people of Georgia, I do. But I'm a man with strengths and weaknesses. I hope the strengths outweigh the weaknesses, but certainly the weaknesses have made me stronger. Mm -hmm. I know you've recently had a bout with depression. I've went through that myself a couple of times. Um, that is a difficult, uh, somewhat difficult to, uh, to break. You know, depression is one of those things that's... Um, it's, it's like we used to, I remember the adage, a red-headed stepchild, if you will. We often hear people talk about depression, but no one really understands it. And there's a lot of truth in that because we don't understand all the components. We know that something goes wrong in people's brains and they start to lose their sense of worth. They start to think that they can't change things. They despair. They're despondent. And it results in suicide. And I, I, I go around when I speak to people and I, I tell them that more people will commit suicide in the United States of America this year than will be murdered. And they say, are you sure? And I said, absolutely. It's sad. Yet you hear about the murders on the 6 o'clock news but not the suicides. And I guess if I could say anything, I would say this to people. Depression is a condition of the brain where you feel like that the pain that you have is not worth continuing to live and you choose to end your life. All depression doesn't result in suicide, but almost all suicide is as a result of depression. And it's a serious problem. It can be medicated with some people. In my case, I was medicated for a very, very long time. And still, as everyone knows, I attempted suicide at a point where I was heavily medicated under medical care I just got to a point that I didn't think it was uh, worth continuing to live. I now look back and I think, how did I get there? It seems so implausible, and a lot of people look at depression that way now, Dennis. They mm -hmm. go, well, I don't understand. Guess what? I don't understand why I got there and why I felt that way. I know I had a lot of stress. I know I had a lot of problems in my life. I had personal problems. I'd made mistakes. I'd lost my family. I had some financial issues. But, you know, in the end, none of that really mattered. And I look back on it and I go, God, why did I have to go through that? And I'll say to everybody, 
someone that you care about may be doing the same thing. Reach out to them, love on them, hug them, tell them you love them, tell them you care, and tell them it can, it will get better. I'm living proof. I'm better. I'm I'm out of the end of depression, and I'm moving forward with my life. I understand. I, uh, I, I, I you can work for me any day. <laughs> a man that admits these mistakes is a man I have I can deal with. Uh, uh, the governor has recently, the governor declined the Medicare uh, issues, uh, and uh, how do you feel about that? It's obviously hurt a lot of, lot of, uh, of our lower or underprivileged people in the state, and, and uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, if I understand what, what you're talking about is the governor declining to accept the conditions of the federal yes. government to receive additional Medicare funding, mm -hmm. uh, you know what, at some point, We've got to draw a line and say we're not going to go any further as a state and nation. And, and I think Governor Deal felt like this was the point to, to draw a line in the sand. As everyone knows, the whole issue with Obamacare and this whole question of the federal government involved in every single aspect of our lives was um, is, is on the front burner in this country. November 6th, we're going to decide it. And uh, I, I support the governor in his decision at this time. I, I think sometimes you have to have short-term pain to have a long-term cure, and he did not believe it was worth Georgia committing the resources necessary to get that matching money. Mm -hmm. You understand to get, oftentimes the federal government will say, I'll give you $2 if you'll spend $2. Well, for Georgia to get their $2, they got to take it from somebody else. And so it's a careful balance, and uh, I think he decided that we'd taken about all we could take at this time. Mm -hmm. Many of our local governments are in severe budget issues, problems. How do you see what would be your remedy to fix that? Well, you know, listen, it's just not go local governments. It's people that are having financial issues. It, this is, this is given our present economic climate and the way we do business, this is one of the toughest times our country's ever faced. And I don't want to say it's like the Great Depression. I didn't live through there. But I do know this, there are people hungry today. There are people who have medical needs they can't get met. There are people who are unemployed. There are people who are losing their houses. And there are governments that can't provide services they feel are vital. But here, here's the bottom line with all of government that you've got to be mindful of. Government doesn't supply any service unless it takes money from citizens to give the service. And you always have to temper that. And I used to, to have a test, do, do we really need that? Do we really need this service? these people's lives and I know local governments right now Paulding Douglas and Carroll County are struggling with that and they make those decisions every day and they got to keep doing that because people are hurting and uh, we've got to get through this economic crisis so how do you how do you see that we're going to finance our government the, the tax issues well I mean, I mean you, you can only get so much tax money out of me or any other guy you know you know uh, uh, about four or five years ago I proposed a major revision of Georgia's entire tax structure. And I'll tell you what, I, we called it the Great Plan. It got defeated, but I attempted to repeal ad valorem taxes. And my thought at that time was that the system of taxing where people slept and ate and land was not a good system. And I said there will be a day when the economy may let up and we shouldn't keep taxing in this manner. What I was trying to say is that the whole ad valorem system was built on the agricultural economy. That's why it has added value. One piece of land was more productive at producing crops than another, so it was taxed higher. Have you ever wondered why property taxes come due in the fall? After the crops came in. I thought that in the current 21st century thought processes, we ought to be looking at consumption taxes. So many of us provide services to somebody and that's, we don't see any realized gain from that, but we exchange money for it. So I propose to change that. I, I failed in that effort, but I do believe fundamentally if we're going to be successful as a state and nation, we have to continue to evolve and think differently about how we fund government. I believe we've got to go towards a more of a consumption-based system and start easing away from property taxes and, frankly, income taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you for uh, leaving the ad valorem taxes on my car. It helps come my birthday. <laughs> well, Dennis, I tried to do that. I actually failed. They did that after I left. And uh, 
that was another example. I didn't understand. You go buy a car and you'd pay three thousand dollars in taxes. Then every year on your birthday you pay taxes. I understood the need of local government to provide services. It seemed to me there was a better place to get it from the consumption of money. I feel the same way about houses and land. I firmly believe that the ad valorem tax system is not the best way long term to fund government. Mm -hmm. well, I, I have to agree with you on that. I, well, we're in agreement. I, I, uh, then, then you and I will vote for it. But yeah. now, let me wait to you what I did. I greatly underestimated county, cities, and school districts that would fight that. And the defense, when they fought me, they used to say, Speaker, the system we have is a reliable and constant and steady source of revenue. Mm -hmm. And I said, but what if the economy changes? What if values go down? And they go, oh, no, values are never going to go down. Well, guess what? As you know, people, we're, we're at an, a real problem, and, and property values have gone down, thereby causing local government's problems. I'm not saying that if we had a sales tax system, a consumption system, there would not have been a decline in revenue. There may well have been. There probably would have been. There's been a decline in the GDP, the gross domestic product of this country. But I just think taxing one group of people who own property and another group that doesn't is fundamentally flawed. Well, many of us are upside down in our mortgages. You've, uh, uh, I'm fortunate because I'm planning to live in the house I'm in for the rest of my life. So it does, I don't care if I'm upside down, but it is hurting a lot of people. Do you have uh, any thoughts on that? You know, Dennis, there's, there's people that are upside down, then there are people that are upside down and backwards. I'm upside down and backwards. And, and here's what, upside down just means you can't sell your house for what it's owed for. Upside down and backwards means you can't sell your house for what it's owed on it, and you're struggling to make your payments. And there are millions of people in this, in this nation, hundreds of thousands in Georgia and in this Senate district, they're struggling to make their house payments. I think that w there's a couple of things that we can do. Uh, I believe it might be time for the state to start looking at uh, what I'll call slowing down the mortgage foreclosure process. Georgia has non-judicial foreclosure. And unfortunately, uh, th there's a careful balance on how that works. And as long as there was only a few foreclosures going on, the balance was good. But what's happening is every time these big mega mortgage companies, and I call them the Bank of Americas and the Wells Fargo, every time they foreclose on a house that was worth 200 they foreclose on it for 70 and they sell it. The person right beside its house goes down in value, and then they can't sell. Well, Wells Fargo or Bank of America are these big banking entities. They just gobble it up. And why do they gobble it up? Because they got federal taxpayer dollars back in them because they're too big to fail. So they just keep getting more money from the federal government, from me and you. They keep foreclosing on people and destroying the market. I think it's time to slow it down, and, and I am going to seriously look at putting a check on the foreclosure process in Georgia. It can be done. We can slow it down. We can have another interval, and we need to slow it down, or, or this market is never going to recover. As long as the boat's taking on water, we're never going to get it to float. Well, I tell you, having a friend that's in the process of losing their home, I I, I will have to agree with you on that. And, 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 and they won't work with him. They, they will they give lip service to working with the yeah. people. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll send their form letters. They'll say that we're working with you. The truth is they really aren't working with you. The truth is they don't care because they can take that house and it won't cost them anything because somebody that took tax dollars is going to reimburse it back to them. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's time to stop. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know what kind of support there will be in the state senate or the state house, but I am prepared to put a judicial uh, step in for foreclosures. Well, this look, this kind of changes the subject away from taxes, and let's look at our immigration, our, our illegal immigration issues in Georgia. I should say, I don't, I don't have a problem with immigration. <laughs> it's just the illegal immigration. Do you see an answer? You know what? Um, it's, it isn't amazing how the economy can change that issue. That issue was a hot button topic three years ago, mm -hmm. and. Illegal immigration, anything that starts with illegal is always a problem. But people coming illegal to this country, while it's a problem, the problem is not nearly as intense as it was when the economy was good. Mm -hmm. And I say that, not that we shouldn't do anything, but we've taken some steps in Georgia to really tighten the screws on illegal immigration. I believe we need to give those time to work, let the economy in tandem 
with those regulations working, I, I think we're we're pretty close to having uh, having done what needs to be done. And uh, I'd like to give it another year or two, let the Supreme Court continue to filter out the issues as to what they're going to allow states to do. I uh, we're going to have to find some answers. I'm glad I'm my that's below my pay grade. <laughs> Well, you know, this country is a nation of immigrants, and uh, we want, we're want we successful because we allow people to come here. We just need to make sure that, that if they're coming here, we we know they're here, and they, they contribute to this, this economy and this society. And that's it. Well, it's, it's so complicated. I have a friend, a uh, Latino, who's here legal. Uh, he has three children that were born in this state. But his wife isn't legal. And how do you solve something like that? Yeah. I, I don't know the answer to that, Dennis. I, I, that, that is a human problem. Mm -hmm. You see, because now you've got a mixed family, what do you do? Send mom home and leave the kids here? I, that's not a good solution. No. It's not a good solution at all. Um, and, you know, maybe we could just introduce common sense to the process. I mean, what a novel idea. The government would actually do something uh, on a common sense. And, you know, the state doesn't oversee. That's a democracy. strong leech now. Common sense, government. I'm not sure those two go together. <laughs> it should. It and should. it should. And I believe that's what's often lacking in some of our decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, well, on, the, um, on our energy issues here, uh, there, we see our gas prices go up every day. Or, do you see any remedy that the state can play in that? I really don't know what what the state can play on, on uh, energy independence. That is such a federal and global issue. Um, yeah, I mean, I got gas uh, earlier today. I pulled up the gas pump. It was $3.70 a gallon. I went, do you realize four years ago it was like two fifty a gallon? And we seemingly have warmed up to it and accepted it. I don't accept it. I think it's hurting people. It seems to me that we had some, some big issues in this country, and it's not, not a Georgia issue, but the Keystone Pipeline uh, pipeline is a good, good example. Why not try to figure out ways to get oil in this hemisphere? And the answer is, is because the environmentalists didn't want us to, and so this administration, the Obama administration, shut it down. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, we have oil and natural gas deposits in North America. We need to seize upon those and use them. And if we have to drill offshore, we have to drill offshore. Are there some risks? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's risk with every single thing that happens in life. But uh, our energy dependence on, uh, on the Mideast uh, and the continued proliferation of China in the economy and their demands on energy sources... Um, we're going to have to have a source here in the United States, and I, I, I look forward to working hand-in-hand -hand with the federal government to do that. Well, I have to agree with you. I think I'd much rather get that pipeline up out of Canada working instead of us trying to work with the Middle East. That's obviously, we're obviously having problems with that. And, uh, I agree with you, Dennis. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we just had our uh, the transportation tax uh, completely to, Totally defeated, soundly defeated, but we still need roads. We still need. You see an answer to that? You know, um, yes and no. And, and and let me let me talk about the the T spots just a minute and tell you what I believe. Uh, first of all, it was bad economic times, and people aren't going to vote for a tax increase in bad economic times. They're just not going to. And uh, secondarily, people in general distrust their government. And they distrust government because government so often has proven not to do what they said they would do. I think a lot of people thought that if they put the sales tax on, it would stay on. The roads that they thought should be fixed wouldn't be fixed, and they'd still have the tax. Somehow we've got to get past that. I, I used this as an example the other day uh, of my own son who, who is over at the University of Georgia. He graduated from high school last year. And I use this as an example of, of how we fail people as government. And I haven't got much traction, but I'm going to keep saying it until somebody listens. For 12 years, my son and everybody else's son and daughter was told if they made a B average in school, they would have the Hope Scholarship at 100% to pay tuition. Last year, while he was a senior in high school after having worked his whole life for a B, the legislature met and they changed the rules and said, Oops, I'm sorry, you made a B. But we're cutting you to 90%, Mr. Richardson. 
my son and I were talking about that, and he said, how can they do that? How can they change the rules after 12 years of school? It doesn't seem fair, Dad. And I went, it's not fair. From now till the end of time, that child and every one of those that we change the rules on knows that when we make a rule, it means absolutely nothing. Because when things change, instead of figuring out another way to fix it, we cut him. He said, what if, what if I had wanted to change the rule and have, instead of a B average, uh, a 79 average? Could I have still got hope? And I went, no, sir, you sure couldn't. That is how voters voted on T-Sploss. They don't believe we're going to spend the money like we said. The second thing was, it was a hodgepodge of projects with a lot of special interest groups. And it, you know what? I'm not certain that the projects under the t spots were actually going to help transportation issues. I think it's a statewide issue. It's got to be addressed statewide. And it's why when I was speaker, I never accepted the regional concept. I, would, I did not approve of fixing transportation at a regional level. I thought it was a statewide problem. Yeah. Well, I've often... You know, this, I think a lot of people have felt like, don't they? let's fix our infrastructure before we build more. I, that's the way I, I voted against it, and that was the reason I voted it. Let's fix our current infrastructure. Fix what we got before we build more. Yeah. That's one idea. Uh, another idea is to look at what the problem is. And, you know, there's all kinds of studies about traffic patterns. And as you know, you can go down on a Saturday afternoon down 7585 North, and there's eight or nine lanes of traffic. And it'll have 20% capacity. But go there on Monday morning, about 7.30 in the morning, you can't move. Well, that's a capacity issue, not a transportation issue. And if you can start doing things to influence traffic patterns, uh, working from home, telecommuting is a, is a big one yeah. that we ought to be promoting more and more. Trying to have different schedules. Here's a good example. When school starts back. The day school starts back in most of the majority of Atlanta system, in the metropolitan Atlanta, traffic patterns change. Mm -hmm. When school gets out, you can see a difference in traffic. Why can't we have some coordination b between those? Uh, the traffic signal coordination is another big one. In, in, in downtown Atlanta, the, the traffic signals, they're not integrated within each other from device to device. Those are things that could be you done now. Go, you haven't tried to go down 278? <laughs> Well, and, and, in, and even in Paulding County, we yeah. don't do a, a, as good a job as we could with our state DOT in thinking about when traffic is going to move, and I know good and well the technology is there to do it. Mm -hmm. Those are some things we could do, and if we started doing those little things, people might give more money for transportation if we needed it. Well, uh, my own example, I own a small business. I have 12 empl employees. Every single one of us live in a different state. Oh, wow. <laughs> but yet we get a lot done. Right. Because... What does it matter where uh, my Navy architect is sitting? Exactly. Or, or, or. And unless you're actually working on a project at a particular place, you can, you can mm -hmm. use technology to get by. And, and that's what we should be doing. Uh, the, the whole concept of transportation, what can we do? You know what? We're going to have to do more with less. We're going to have to plan. We're going to have to think. And, and I don't see us coming back with a transportation sales tax in the, in the foreseeable future. Well, Talking about people working at home, I've often thought, send everybody. Where does it matter where your secretary sits? All she's, her, her job is to, to uh, I mean, her job is to, you know, produce letters and never what she has to do in an office. She can do that from home. No. Uh, uh, you, you can come up with some new and innovative ideas, yeah. and I think that's what we're going to have to do. Yeah, I think so. On our education, we obviously continue to seem to have problems funding that. And uh, you know, it, I, what bothers me is um, America spends more money on education per student than any country in the world, yet we continue to slide, and we continue to slide in the world's educational level. I don't know where we're at, what, number seven, number eight in the world now? But I could be in I could Well, De Dennis, that you, you just answered your question. It's not about money. I mean, you know, every time there's a failure in education, people say we need more money. Money is not the answer. Uh, I, I think the I think you've got to have money. I think you've got to have options. But, but and, and, and parents need the right to, to choose. But let me tell you where I think we fail in Georgia. We have changed the way we count who graduates from high school or not twice 
in the last five years. Now, now I want to say that again. We have changed the way we count whether people graduate from high school or not, and the number has ranged from 65% to 80%, back down to 67%. If we can't even count whether Johnny started first grade and graduated from high school, how are we going to teach kids to compete in this, in this world? I, I do not understand counting whether somebody's a high school graduate or not. If Johnny starts first grade and doesn't in 12 years graduate from high school, probably Johnny is a high school dropout. Now, is it possible he moved to another state? Yeah, but, and, and that's what the people that have these systems say. They go, oh, well, we have people moving in and out of Georgia. And I go, well, we have social security numbers. We have this, this student ID system that we track students. Why can't we get it right? But here's what the current number is. The current number is, according to the Georgia Department of Education, that one out of three high school students in Georgia does not graduate. That is a shame. It's abysmal. It's embarrassing. We're failing 33 and one-third percent. And we want to know why we're failing in education. That's why if you didn't graduate from high school, you're going to have a tough time competing. Now, what's the problem? The problem, I believe, and educators will all argue about this, the problem, I believe, is we try to do all things for all people. Everybody has to take calculus. Everybody has to go to college. Everybody has to take college prep English. No, they don't. We have got to partner with technical and adult education. The governor's got a task force working on this right now. We've got to teach skills. Right now, today in Georgia, there's a shortage of expert welders. Why? Because nobody's been taught to weld. What happened? We're always going to need welders. We're always going to need carpenters, plumbers, electricians, people to pave roads and do these road projects you and I are talking about, and water, sewer. You don't have to go to college to be a welder. You can be taught that in high school and have a skill, and we can graduate you from high school as a skilled welder, electrician, plumber, fill in the blank, and that's where we're failing. We need to identify who those students are at risk for not graduating. We need to teach them a skill, and we need to graduate them from high school. And we're not doing it, and until we start doing it, we shouldn't criticize anybody's suggestion or anything else we do about education. I have to agree 100% there with you. I, I get, I get, see, I get upset. I get upset because I don't understand. We, we play a game with how we count those people because we want to try to make ourselves look good. I know how that happened. I know the call that was made on, on putting that into count in the fashion. Just the, three weeks ago, we went back to the right system of counting. And the truth is, is Georgia is graduating about two-thirds of its students. The rest are being lost forever. Well, let's bring this home for a minute. I'm a citizen of... Uh uh, Paulding County here moved out here about four and a half Congratulations. years. Congratulations, good. And uh, uh, obviously, we've had some problems attracting business here. Uh, what would you? What could you do as uh, an office to help Camden County in that issue? Well, uh, Paulding, Douglas, Carroll County are all in the Senate District, and here's the interesting thing that I always tell people. Every, there are 159 counties in Georgia, and every single one of them has the same issue. Each one of them says, what can we do to attract business here? Now then, when we leave the 159 counties in Georgia, there's another 100 and so in Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida. I think I touched everybody that's around us. And they're doing the same thing. They're saying, we want it in Alabama. We want it in Tennessee. What can we do? Start graduating high school students with skills. Start graduating about 88 to 98 percent high school students and have a skilled workforce in Georgia. And all those companies that are going somewhere else will say, hey, have you looked out in Paulding County, Carroll County, Douglas County? They've got this program. They're graduating 20 points above the state average from high school because they're teaching skills that we need in our business. And that will bring business. That, more than anything else, a skilled workforce is what drives businesses to locate. Businesses come to Georgia, one of the first things they do is say, well, what kind of workers can we get? Do they have any skills? Can they do what we need? Technology is advancing rapidly as we go up. And, you know, Paulding County just got a very big business in a role coming here. Uh, there were concerns as to whether we had enough skilled workers that could take those high-paying jobs. 
educate them, provide some tax incentives at a local level, bearing in mind that every other jurisdiction is providing those same tax incentives to get them there, and let, let's, uh, let's get them here in, in this area of the state. But start with high school graduation and you'll see what happens. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, it's been a pleasure. Is there anything else that we, you'd like to get into or I missed? You know what? There, there is, and, and it was on our board a while ago, um, and, and I don't know. We, I think we just skipped right over it. We are talking about ethics, and I, I think it bears con uh, conversation to talk about ethics. Um, ethics is a buzzword that some people want to hurl at somebody. It's kind of like saying sin or transgressions, uh, and they say, well, well he, he's unethical or he's a sinner, uh, and, and those are not always synonymous, but people should have confidence that their elected officials are doing a good job and not unreasonably influenced. And uh, during this last ballot process, there were two questions put for Republicans and Democrats that basically said, do you think there ought to be a, a, a cap on the amount that anybody spends on a legislator? It passed with over 85% in this county, in this area, uh, if I were to get elected. That would be one of the first things I would sponsor. Put it in. If the people want it, okay, take that off the table. And uh, some have asked me, what would I do on that? I said, absolutely. It's, it's not an issue. Just if people are concerned about that, put the ban in and be done with it. That's not all ethics is. Ethics is kind of like regulating um, anything. You can make rules, and the rules are only as good as the people. Well, my, my own small business and having to deal with some big businesses. Uh, uh, I find that uh, ethics is uh, usually the last thing on the table. Uh, well, and it's unfortunate because you can't, um, uh, it's very difficult. I'm a small defense contractor, small. Okay. And, uh, but I have to deal with the large, big defense contractor. Yeah, and, a small fish in a big pond yeah, with big uh, fish. Uh -huh. And uh, let me tell you, you can get your throat cut real fast. I understand. And, and you know, you really, uh, there's always, people have always had a distrust for their elected officials. And um, I hate that. I, I, I really do. Uh, I know during my time that there were people that distrusted me. Uh, I made some decisions in my own life, my personal life, that were wrong mm -hmm. for me. But whenever I came down to trying to make decisions that affected the state, uh, I, I always was trying to make decisions that I thought were for the long-term good of, of the majority. Now, you can never make a decision that takes care of everybody. You've got to try to be thinking differently, uniquely, and with, with vision as you make decisions that affect a state like Paulding, I mean, like Georgia with Paulding, Douglas, and Carroll counties because the world's changed. I mean, you, you think about something like the technology that we have now, computers, the very program that we're doing here that goes out over the Internet. People need to believe in their elected uh, uh, officials, and, and my pledge is that that I have I've learned from my mistakes, and... Um, Every decision I make, I'm going to do to try to do something better for Georgia and for this area. And uh, if if I can get in this seat, if I can get people to give me a second chance and, and elect me, I'll do the very best job uh, that I can possibly do. I, I believe I'm the most qualified person for the job. I spent a lifetime training. I say that and people say a lifetime ago, yeah, I studied political science when I was in high school. I studied in college. I was in elective office for 14 years, and uh, during that time I learned a lot about government. And uh, there's never a right or wrong answer with government, but there's a, usually a better answer. And, and that's what you always have to be looking for, the better or the best answer for majority of the people. Well, I do believe you'll do your best. I, I certainly will. Uh, I thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I get this has been Interviews to Suit, the Peacock TV production.